You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 150. We made it to 150. This is our fifth episode in our chronicle of events in the Middle East in the last two years of the war. Last episode saw the British troops advance out of Egypt and into Palestine, where they were stopped by Ottoman troops at Gaza. This episode we will see a new leader arrive for the troops in the theater in the form of General Allenby. Allenby would then lead the British and Commonwealth forces in the Third Battle of Gaza, by far the best known of the battles in the Palestinian theater. Victory during this battle would then lead to the capture of Jerusalem, and then advances beyond, eventually all the way into Syria. This will be our final episode on the events of the war in the Middle East, with our focus shifting next week to events after the armistice in 1918. When General Edmund Allenby found out that he was being moved from France to Palestine in June 1917, he was not very pleased. France was seen as the main event, the main theater. Everything else was just a sideshow. And and to Allenby, this transfer to the Middle East was basically a demotion. He was being sent because Lloyd George still strongly believed that the war would be won outside of Western Europe, and he was constantly searching for an alternative to placing British war effort focus on the Western Front. The Middle East was the prime point of these efforts, but the failure at Second Gaza prompted him to want a new commander, which would hopefully be more successful. When Allen B. was sent to Egypt, Lloyd George would recall that, quote, I told him in the presence of Sir William Robertson that he was to ask us for such reinforcements and supplies as he found necessary, and we would do our best to provide them. If you do not ask, it will be your fault. If you do ask and do not get what you need, it will be ours. I said the cabinet expected Jerusalem before Christmas. When Allenby arrived, he would ask for more reinforcements, a lot of them. He wanted several more infantry divisions, and with those divisions, he would once again attack at Gaza. The plan for the third battle would in some ways be very similar to what had been done in the second. The big change, and the most famous change, was the decision to launch an attack at Beersheba. In 1917, Beersheba was just a small village. It was still a major nexus of roads, though, with five major roads radiating out of the village and then several smaller tracks leading in all directions. This action had been discussed during the planning for previous attacks, but it had been denied due to a lack of resources, which was not as much of a problem for Allenby. The plan that would be used would be one put forward by General Chetwood, and in this attack, the the Beersheba operation would be the responsibility of the newly created Desert Mounted Corps, which contained three cavalry divisions and the 20th Corps, which held four infantry divisions. These troops would move forward with their attack several days after the bombardment at Gaza had begun, but before the attack began there. The hope was that this large effort would pull Ottoman reinforcements to the east, while still capturing the city and its surroundings. Once the city had been captured, and more importantly the wells within the city had been captured, the cavalry would then continue to the north and west to try and get behind the Ottomans at Gaza and cut off their retreat. This retreat would then be caused by the second main point of effort near Gaza, which would be launched after after several days of artillery fire. This would then hopefully put the Ottomans to flight, then run them right into the Desert Mounted Corps, which was advancing out of Beersheba. If all of this could be achieved, the British would be able to advance almost as far as their feet could take them. 
During the planning and preparation phase, it was critical that the British keep the attack at Beersheba a secret. While the British would have more men, they were far away from more support, and they would have to capture the village quickly or they would run out of water. To try and maintain the required secrecy, there was a lengthy set of deceptions built into the preparations for the attack. The longest lasting of these would be the cavalry demonstrations which were made near the town that get the Ottomans used to seeing some troops near their lines. And it also gave the British good cover to allow them to examine the ground and survey the Ottoman defenses. The second, and more immediately impactful, and quite honestly, far more interesting deception, was performed by Colonel Meinertshagen. Meinertshagen would have a plan which was permitted, where he went out on a fake reconnaissance mission towards the Ottoman lines near Beersheba. During this mission, he allowed himself to be spotted and engaged by the defenders. When this engagement began, he dropped his rifle, notebooks, some letters, and some money, and ran away while also faking being wounded. These documents were all fake, and spoke of fake plans, but they were recovered by the Ottomans and sent up the chain of command. An Australian patrol was sent into the area to act like they were frantically searching for the lost possessions, which they knew the Ottomans already had, so that the Ottomans would be more likely to think that they were genuine. When these documents were given to the German and Ottoman commanders in the area, they were not sure if they should believe them, knowing that there was a chance that they were fake. But even though they knew this and they were skeptical of the information, it would still throw them off the scent of the upcoming attack, sowing doubt which was just enough to give the British the opportunity for surprise. For the effort at Gaza, the British had assembled over 200 artillery pieces, including critically 68 heavy guns. These guns were then provided with mountains of ammunition, allowing them to fire for over a week while the fighting was occurring at both Gaza and Beersheba. Overall, this would be the heaviest bombardment of the war in the Middle Eastern theater, and it would be against Ottoman defenses that were not nearly as strong as those that the British encountered on the Western Front. In many areas, the defenses were only a single line, instead of a defense in depth, and this allowed for the guns to focus on just a few targets. As I mentioned earlier, even though the guns would begin to fire at Gaza, that was not the first point of effort. Instead, that would be the attack at Beersheba. The movement of troops to the east and towards Beersheba would take place over the course of an entire week. The reason that it took this long was to allow for the greatest possible secrecy, while both the Desert Mounted Corps and the 20th Corps were slowly shifted. Two whole corps is a large number of troops in comparison to the total strength that Allenby had at his disposal, and the total number of expected Ottoman defenders in Beersheba. This overwhelming force was thought necessary because quickly capturing Beersheba was essential. The large number of British troops and cavalry dedicated to the attack could not be properly supplied from the main British area around Gaza. It was essential that they capture the wells in Beersheba to allow them to have the required water for both men and horses. The attempts to keep these large movements secret, for the most part, failed. And by October 23rd, a full week before the attack was due to launch, the Ottomans had already knew that there was something going to happen. The biggest clue was that so many of the camps behind the British front had been abandoned. While they realized that an attack might happen, there was not too much that the Ottomans could do other than work harder on their defenses that they were even right before the attack trying to complete. The fortifications were the sparsest in the east and north of the town, while in the south and west they were in far better shape. Now, the Ottomans did have one advantage that the British could not take away, could never take away. The British had to take Beersheba. The water issue was critical. And therefore, all the defenders had to do was hunker down in their trenches, behind their barbed wire and with their machine guns, and hold out, even for a single day, and let thirst defeat their enemies. Before the attack was launched, the British infantry, who would be responsible for capturing the stronger Ottoman defenses in the south and west of the village, slowly pushed closer to the Ottoman lines. Behind them, the mounted troops, who were the last to arrive, pushed to the eastern side of the village, hoping that they remained partially out of sight of the Ottoman defenders to maintain at least some form of surprise. While the Ottomans knew that something might happen soon, when it did actually occur and the infantry assault went forward early in the morning of October 31st, they were taken at least momentarily by surprise. The infantry attack went forward in two stages. The first was an advance over the broken ground up to the Ottoman wire. Then the infantry paused while they cut the wire, which had been partially damaged by the artillery, but not completely cleared. 
Once this was complete, the artillery was moved forward so that it would be in better range of the defenders. During this lull, the attackers were vulnerable to our Ottoman fire, but the infantry were able to partially protect themselves in the broken ground, and this helped to reduce the number of casualties that they took, although it did not eliminate them entirely. Once the guns were in their new positions, the attack continued, and while the Ottoman defenders put up a good fight, there were just too many attackers, and by the early afternoon their positions had been taken. Casualties were around 1,100 for the British, and probably similar for the Ottomans, although their numbers are a bit more fuzzy. To the east of the village, the Anzac cavalry was in position for their attack by 8.30 a.m., after having been on the move all night to get into position. Their objectives were the two important hills of Telasaba and Berescadi, which were to the east and northeast of the village, respectively. Berescadi was the responsibility of the 2nd Australian Light Horse Brigade, and when they attacked, they moved forward quickly in a dispersed formation. When they came within rifle range of the defenders, they then dismounted and made their final assault on foot. This was a textbook attack for the Australian cavalry as they prepared before the war, with the cavalry acting more as mounted infantry armed with rifles, instead of more traditional saber-armed cavalry. When Berescotti had not been greatly difficult to capture, Telesaba was a different matter. Here, the New Zealand Mounted Brigade was tasked with taking the hill, with the Australian 3rd Light Horse Regiment on their left for support. On this hill, the Ottoman defenses were stronger and better aided by the terrain. The hill was steeper, and it provided better fields of fire for machine guns. Even with this increased difficulty, the hill would still be captured, although it would take until mid-afternoon, which delayed the next part of the attack. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. While the first wave of attacks had went well, although they were slightly delayed, the most important attack still had to take place, the assault on the village itself. A slight delay in the previous attacks from the east and west meant that there was some question about whether or not the attack on the village should be performed at all. General Chauvel, who commanded the Desert Mounted Corps, only had two mounted brigades left in reserve, the 4th Australian Light Horse and the British 5th Mounted Brigade. If left to his own devices, it is likely that Chevelle would have chosen to close down the attack at this point. In this type of situation, it was often felt, and had been taught before the war, that it was better to put the health of the horses near the top of the list of concerns, even if it meant not capturing an objective. If the attack was launched and failed, there would be some serious consequences for the horses. Many of them would probably die of thirst. However, when Chauvel discussed the situation with Allenby, he was told by Allenby that the attack should definitely be performed and as soon as possible. 
With these orders in hand, Chauvel began planning for the attack, although there were not many options. Really, the only thing that could be done was a direct cavalry charge against the Turkish positions. It was the only option that could be done by the forces at hand, and the only one fast enough to capture the village on that day. These orders would be sent out at 4.30 in the afternoon, with the 4th Light Horse Brigade ordered to assault over open ground the Ottoman positions to the southeast of Beersheba, and then drive through them and into the village. Also at roughly 4.30, the Ottoman commander in Beersheba, Ismet Bey, began the process of evacuating his forces, believing that his situation was untenable. With this order, the town would fall to the Australian attack. The only question was whether or not the Ottomans would have time to properly sabotage and destroy the wells before the Australians arrived. The British and the Australians did not know that the process of destruction had begun, or that they were now racing against time. Two of the Australian cavalry regiments lined up with four yards between each man, and began to move forward. They were supported by two batteries of horse artillery and a few other artillery guns. With most of the Ottoman forces abandoning the city, those left in the rear guard would have little support, but those that were in the rear guard would stay and fight, but they found it difficult to accurately aim at the fast-charging cavalry. One cavalryman was Lieutenant Colonel Murray Boucher, and he would say, quote, It was noticed that the morale of the enemy was greatly shaken through our troops galloping over his positions, thereby causing his riflemen and machine gunners to lose all control of fire discipline. Some Ottoman machine guns began to fire on the left, but were rapidly silenced by British guns. When the first Australians reached the first line of trenches, they dismounted and fought hand-to-hand with the defenders, while those behind continued to charge towards the town. The Ottoman defenders had no hope of holding the line, and while they did inflict some casualties, almost 2,000 of them would be captured. With the attack developing so rapidly, the Ottoman and German engineers who were trying to sabotage the wells were only partially successful. However, they did have enough time to destroy some of them, reducing the ability of the cavalrymen to water their horses. This would then result in the cancellation of the third phase of the attack, the advance to the north and west to get behind the Ottoman troops at Gaza. The attack at Beersheba is best known for this cavalry charge that ended the day. It's a good example of how a properly executed cavalry charge could still be effective, but it was against an enemy that was already starting to retreat, in positions that were quite weak and not adequately protected by barbed wire. With the capture of Beersheba, the focus of the attack shifted back to the west and to Gaza. The goal of this attack was to break through the defensive line between the city and the coast. The Ottoman defenders had put a lot of work into these defenses in the six months before the attack, and it resulted in fortification complexes that were far stronger than during the first two battles of Gaza. One advantage that the defenders had, and a disadvantage that the British would have to deal with, was the composition of the ground in which they were on. The Ottoman defenses were based on firm ground, often anchored in stone. However, the British would have to attack over sand dunes, which is never easy when carrying a lot of weight. There were also grand plans for this attack, with up to five stages being planned. However, they would be mostly unsuccessful. The British were able to pry the Ottoman defenders out of some positions, but by the afternoon they were no longer pushing forward, even at great cost. This would necessitate more fighting on November 4th, and then on the 6th as well. By this point, the Ottoman defenders were finally pushed out of some of their strongest positions around Gaza, and the decision was made to retreat. By the time that the British realized what was happening, the Ottomans were already on their way out of the city. After the attack, and even until today, there have been a lot of discussions about the attacks at Gaza and Beersheba. There are many who believe that the attacks at Beersheba were a mistake, and they weakened the attacks at Gaza, which made them less successful. The biggest area where the attacks were weakened was in cavalry support, and perhaps if this casualty that attacked at Beersheba had instead been used at Gaza, then the Ottoman retreat could have been properly followed and exploited, perhaps even preventing the Ottomans from re-establishing a defensive line to the north of Jerusalem. However, all of these possible outcomes are complete guesses. One concrete change that came about due to the actions at Beersheba was a change in how cavalry was used for the rest of the war in the Middle East. The Australians had come into the war strongly believing in the supremacy of mounted infantry, not traditional cavalry. Mounted infantry were designed to move forward on horse and to use the speed of their horses to close the distance quickly, but then they were expected to dismount before getting into any serious fighting. The success of the charge at Beersheba began to change this. 
A memorandum that was circulated in January 1918 would state the new viewpoint of cavalry in the Middle East like this. Quote, Mounted troops are capable today, as in the past, of crossing a fire-swept zone, so long as they moved quickly and extended. In most of the attacks, the squadrons of each regiment followed on another in succession of waves. They were carried through at a gallop. The morale effect of a mounted attack has lost none of its potency. On one occasion, the horses were so exhausted after the gallop that the enemy, if he had stood his ground, could have shot down our men with ease as they topped the crest. It is in close cooperation with infantry and not when acting independently that mounted troops may expect to find the most favorable conditions and to gain the most far-reaching results. End quote. Now, if you'd like to hear me talk about cavalry a lot more, I suggest going over to patreon.com slash history of the great war and consider becoming a supporter. I did a four episode series on cavalry during the war, and it's probably some of my favorite episodes I've ever done. After the Ottoman retreat from Gaza, it was only a matter of time before the British captured Jerusalem, and this was accomplished on December 11th. I'm sure it would not shock modern listeners to hear that the capture of the city was important, but it was also fraught with new difficulties for Allenby. I will let Matthew Hughes, from his work General Allenby and the Campaign of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, June 1917 to November 1919, explain some of the difficulties experienced by Allenby and how he tried to get around them. Quote, with Allenby's advance to Jerusalem, France and Britain had to deal with the political problem as who was to administer Palestine. Francis Georges Picot, as the head of the French mission in Palestine, attempted to assert his control with Allenby at a meal following Jerusalem's fall. The result is amusingly recounted by T.E. Lawrence, who is present and remembered how, when Peacock told Allenby that he would take over civilian government of Jerusalem, a silence followed, as salad, chicken mayonnaise, and fortigas sandwiches hung in our mouths wet and unmunched. For a moment, Allenby's entourage thought that their idol might betray a frailty. But then, Allenby's face grew red. He swallowed, his chin coming forward, whilst he said grimly, In the military zone, the only authority is that of the commander-in-chief, myself. This forced Pico to protest. But Sir Grey, Sir Edward Grey, but he was cut short. Sir Edward Grey referred to the civilian government which will be established when I judge that the military situation permits, end quote. And that was that. The capture of Jerusalem would represent a milestone for the attack into Palestine. It had been the most important objective, and capturing it by Christmas had been the goal since Allenby arrived. With it now achieved, the question became what to do next. The British knew that they would have to take some time to prepare for their next steps, and there were both ambitious and non-ambitious suggestions in terms of what those next steps should be. By far the most ambitious was a proposal to launch an amphibious landing at Alexandretta. This city was hundreds of miles north of Allenby and its forces in Palestine, but a successful landing would have been a huge blow to the Ottoman war effort, and would have cut the railway that was supplying all of the Ottoman forces in Palestine and Syria. This plan never came to fruition, with the previous British amphibious failures, like, like at a place called Gallipoli, you may have heard of it, played no small part in giving the British cold feet. A less ambitious plan, which was followed through on, was the launching of raiding expeditions north of Jerusalem. In these raids, the Arab forces under Faisal Hussein played a critical role. There were two primary raids launched, one in late March and the other in early May. During these attacks, the Arab cavalry would harass and execute hit-and-run attacks against the Ottoman supply areas. These raids would make the situation for the Ottoman troops, especially those south of Damascus, almost untenable. For the first half of 1918, Allenby did not think that he would be able to advance deep into Syria. To start with, after the capture of Jerusalem, many of his British units were sent back to Europe. Like almost every other European general, and not without a slight dash of racism, Allenby believed that these British infantry units were his best men. There was also the slight problem of geography, and how extended such an advance would make the British supply lines. In some ways, Allenby's mindset would mirror the views of many Western Front generals who would not believe that the attacks in 1918 would actually end the war, and when they did launch an offensive, which Allenby would at the Battle of Megiddo, the, big, the massive success that they experienced surprised them. Instead of being able to properly retreat like they had at Gaza and Beersheba, the Ottoman forces instead just sort of fell apart. Once it was clear to Allenby that the Ottoman forces were disintegrating in front of him, the race was on. 
Soon, Indian cavalry was on its way to Damascus, and other troops continued even further north. Damascus would soon be captured, a symbolic victory on par with Jerusalem, and with its fall, the Ottomans began to discuss peace. The Ottoman government began to send out serious peace feelers during the first week of October. The British wanted to discuss possible peace terms with the Supreme War Council, which contained British, French, American, and Italian representatives. The British also began to move even greater naval strength into the eastern Mediterranean. Much like in other areas, as soon as the war appeared to be on its way to completion, the greatest enemy for the British became the French. The greatest fear in London was that the war would end too soon, before the British could occupy all of the areas that they wanted to control after the war. This fear would cause them to move troops from Mesopotamia to Mosul, and in Syria it meant an advance towards Aleppo. The final armistice would be signed on October 30th. Its conditions represented essentially a total surrender for the Ottomans. Their empire was finished. It's a long, long way to Tipperary.